Hi everybody, welcome to chapter 9 for our EDUC 103 course. We're going to be looking at management of injuries and acute illness. Um, this is the chapter when we're going to kind of go over the different types of opportunities you have with CPR or different medical certifications related to early learning centers. Obviously this is something that you can't get as a part of this class is an online iteration of it, but we'll give you some of the content, some of the concepts, and that'll probably help you better understand it. As normal, here are the NACI standards so you can see the direct correlation to what I'm speaking about and what we're learning. Um, all of these, I would argue, are very important in this particular chapter. So um, we've already said multiple times that unintentional injuries are going to occur, even if you're great and wonderful and this is what you do for a living and fantastic in it. Kids are going to get injured because they're kids, period. Just the way it is. Um, so prevention is impossible. So you just really need to know what to do um, if something should happen. And then that's why having a plan in place is something that's probably going to help you better and more than anything else. So emergency plans. Um, make sure that you have personnel that understand infant and child CPR and basic first aid techniques should be one of the first questions that you ask potential employees. Um, you have to get contact information. You have to have a first aid kit with you at all times. And then this big idea right here that I keep stressing, and I said it in the last chapter, these kits should be prepared to take with you on field trips. If you're going on a field trip, you need to have a first aid kit readily available for the students. So you don't need me to stand up here and read you a list of basic first aid supplies. But if you want something to actually look at what you should have, this provides a great list that you can reference. And this is the other thing, too. The child will always call out to you. If they're in pain or they are injured, they are going to scream for you to help them because they're kids. So your responsibility is immediate care to child. Anything that you were doing that stops so that you can provide proper care to the child. Then if more arrangements need to be made, you call for those, you call the parent, you call the guardian, and you make sure the child feels at ease. Um, as long as you know basic things to keep your kids safe, you'll be fine with this. So our book talks about the ABCs, the whole notion of making sure that the air passage is open and clear. Um, tilt the child's head back by placing your hand on the child's forehead and push downward, and place the fingers of your other hand under the child's chin and lift upward, and that helps with the open passage. Breathe, make sure that the child's chest is moving up and down, listen for air to escape, and then look for circulation and if the child is coughing or moving. This is all, goes without saying, basic general practices involved in your CPR. So, <clears throat> emergency care versus first aid. Um, emergency care you do in a life-threatening situation. First aid is honestly, it's putting a band-aid on things. Um, if there's a minor cut or headache or stomach ache, all you want to do is make the kid feel better. If you do that, you're good. Um, but the emergency care is something that you as professionals need to be aware of and you need to make sure you're monitoring appropriately. So absence of breathing. Um, you know, my belief is you all should be certified in basic CPR for this reason, because a lot can happen, especially if you're working in an early learning center. Um, if you're in a school district, there's going to be other personnel that are certified in CPR. Should you be? I think so, but that's certainly up to you. It's your decision. But, you know, you have to make sure that you are calm and confident if you're ever in a position where you have to administer this type of technique. So. We give you all of the directions for CPR. Um, when a child is not breathing, you have to call for emergency help immediately, or better, have somebody else do that while you're focusing on performing CPR, if you're the only certified one that will actually be there to, um, to do it. One of the things that normally gets, gets lost in this procedure is the idea if there's anything that can be seen that's stuck in the child's mouth, if you can just take a quick sweep of your fingers around their mouth, if there's anything that's excess there and you can get rid of it, that's something that a lot of people forget about um, when they're performing CPR, but that's definitely a consideration that you should do. So I give you some more steps, and then I also want to tell you that there is a effective YouTube video that you can obviously watch on your own related to CPR, um, that the link is available here. Um, notice the amount of chest compressions that are expected. 
And this is one of the reasons why it's important that you spend time practicing this stuff before you actually administer it. So I would always ask, in, you know, if we were doing a discussion board specifically for this chapter, um, I would say in child development you have to have it in school districts, you have options with it. Um, it's not required in most school districts that you are CPR certified, but in a child development situation, it's mandatory. And that's more or less because you, you are more of a teacher and you have more autonomy in an early learning center than you would in a school. And in a school, there are going to be personnel that are certified in CPR, and that's important. So 90% of deaths um, for kids under the age of five come from airway um, obstruction. And you know we talk about reasons being it could be foods, it could be this, it could be anything. But here's the truth. If there's one thing that we can all agree on, it is the fact that children will most likely put everything in their mouths. So because of that, that is going to create a possible airway obstruction. Um, it's just part of nature and how a kid learns. So that's something that you need to consider. So some foods commonly linked to choking. Once again, here's a list. You can read that on your own. I don't need to read you directly what they are. Some objects linked to choking. Ask yourself how many people in your life that you know that actually swallowed a coin or put a coin in their mouth because I think everybody watching this probably knows somebody or did it themselves. And when do it when do it uh, when do it administer? Um, child most of the time can dislodge something through coughing on their own, and it's a natural instinct, so the kid doesn't need prompted to cough, they're just going to cough. But if you can't, then you know, then you have to take uh, life-saving measures in order to do it, and it's basically if the kid stops breathing, if there's a high-pitched sound, if they're unresponsive, um, but I gave you another video that kind of looks at that as well. You can certainly watch that on your own as well. So if there's a severe injury shock could occur. Um, some of the conditions involved in it that you're going to see a lot. Um, the big one that you're going to see, especially with the populations you're working with, is pale, cool, and clammy skin. Um, and if that occurs, it's kind of a sign telling you that the body wants you to provide support and that that child probably needs emergency treatment as soon as possible. So same thing that we normally do. We elevate the child's feet. We give them body heat. We use a moistened cloth, we stay calm, and then we observe their breathing, and if we have to do CPR, we do CPR. But the key thing is you want to try to stay calm and help the kid until emergency help arrives. That's the most important thing. So bleeding. Once again, let's be realistic. Kids bleed. Kids are always going to bleed. Um, cuts probably aren't something to worry about that often, but if it's deep or it won't stop, then it has to have attention. Um, you have to react quickly and calmly. Get backup medical attention if you have somebody else that's in your room that can provide it. That's great because you want to cover it up so the blood doesn't get all over the place so the other kids don't get fascinated by blood because kids are fascinated by blood and some are grossed out by it. Um, you also have to make sure that you document that and you notify the parents. Um, so you basically need to make immediate and quick action when you're dealing with a child that's bleeding. So obviously you want to place something over it. Um, if you can place more bandages on top, um, that's something you want to consider doing. You're better off putting more bandages on top instead of pulling off old bandages because then the bleeding might exacerbate. Um, and you can apply an ice pack if that seems to help slow the blood flow. Um, and uh, it can also decrease swelling as well. So diabetes, um, you know, in schools, most children are trained on what to do with diabetes. And they administer they're, they administer the treatment themselves, and it's something that's part of what's going on. In an early learning center, that's really not the case. You're one of the people that's responsible for this, and you have to be aware of the proceedings that you have to do. So hypoglycemia is insulin shock. This is when there are low levels of sugar in the child's blood. Um, if they have an excessive dose of insulin or not enough food, um, this is something that basically shows that they don't have enough sugar in their bloodstream. So if you, this one is easy to fix 
for the most part because if you can just simply give a child a sugary substance, this will help them recover. Our book says orange juice is the best thing to do because the body will rapidly absorb it um, and avoid hard candies because you don't want a child to choke on it. So hyperglycemia is much more serious. This is caused by little available insulin, a bad diet, illness, or stress, or you forgot a dose of insulin. Um, what you can do for this is try to make sure that the kid you know, stays warm and you call for help whenever you possibly can, but this is something to be more worried about. Um, drowning kids, um, kids do drown. It's a leading cause of unintentional death, um, and it'll happen basically through, um, through exploration, and also because kids have poor muscle coordination at a young age. Um, but where is it likely to happen at? It's places that caregivers forget about. Things like buckets, bathtubs, toilets, wading pools, outdoor features, ponds, and bird baths, and less likely to be a major pool. So that's something that you need to consider as well, especially if you're dealing with one, two, and three year olds. So you have to know the area, um, and when you're looking at some of these park environments and, and early learning centers, you want to see if they have water stuff available. Um, and once a child, if a child is rescued, you want to do CPR immediately. Um, kids will vomit after, uh, after anybody experiences a, a drowning situation, they're likely to vomit water or vomit food, um, and you want to try to rest them on their side so that they don't choke. Um, it's still important for them to have medical help because you want to follow through and make sure it isn't something that's more serious. So head injuries, um, all kids are going to hit their head and fall down. The thing is, um, you don't, a lot of people don't know what to look for, and it might, it might take days for there to be symptoms of bleeding or swelling that occurs through a head injury. So I give you some examples of what early signs of a head injury could, could include, and some symptoms of some more serious ones. So once a child gets a head injury, the smartest thing that you can do is have them sit down and not be as active because you don't know the seriousness of it. Um, if a kid gets cut on the head, they're going to bleed more than anywhere else, and that's going to cause issues as well, so you have to consider that. Um, and the child might be overly alarmed, but that might not be the case. Um, try to stay calm, apply pressure to the wound until you know what it actually is. And that's the way that you can help with head injuries. So poisoning, um, kids can be poisoned through um, inhaling something, ingestion, absorption, or injection. Most of the time, they swallow something they shouldn't have swallowed, and it's why you know we have the Mr. Yuck sticker. Mr. Yuck says no, and he will never go away. Um, but signs of that, you can obviously look at all of those. But most of the time, poison occurs through the ingesting of something that shouldn't have been ingested. So there are different types of treatment depending on what the poison is, and that's something that you have to consider as well. So we give you a list of them. You can read these on your own. Um, but you obviously know that the strong acid ones, those are ones that should be taken very, very, very seriously, and so should the petroleum products. Um, but it's why we got to keep things away from kids and make sure that they don't have open containers and put things in their mouth that shouldn't be there. So if a child has swallowed a poisonous substance, um, one of the most important things that you need to do is, give, is don't give them anything to drink or make them vomit. You want to make sure that you want to see if there's a chemical burn. You want to see if, if something could be smelled on their breath. And then try to find the container they drank it from. Try to retrace their steps. Call poison control immediately. And they can give you advice and guidance on what you should be doing. So. Once again, you know, I go without saying this, but children fall. Children get hurt because they are kids. Um, you know, cuts and scrapes occur, um, and those are the most common types of injuries that children face. Um, the main concern is to control bleeding and to prevent infection. So once again, as we stated before, one of the things that you want to do and kind of cut off at the bottom, you want to make sure that you wash the wound, apply pressure. If there's an antibiotic ointment, apply that, and then bandage where the cut has been. And that's just something you have to be aware of and you have to do.
So bites are a problem too. You know, I think of animal bites, we all think of insects and animal bites, but there can be human bite problems as well that can cause joint pain, cramps, vomiting, fever, uh, different, different things based on the reaction that the child might have. Um, don't take rabies as something that can be taken lightly, it can't be. You might see more kids in today's society experience rabies than ever before, and that's the honest to God's truth. So blisters normally come from rubbing or friction. Um, one of the things that you want to do is not break the blister, but if it does break, you know, wash it with soap and water and cover it with a bandage. Um, bruises, kids get bumped and fall all the time, so you don't have to worry about it. Um, as long as it doesn't grow into something else. But if you can apply an ice pack several times a day, that can help them with how they manage the bruise as well. So burns are more serious with young children because of a smaller surface area. Um, one of the things that I would note for those of you that are looking at this for the PECT exam, um, the different types of degrees of burns, this is important. First degree is red, red skin, pain and swelling. Um, second degree, it's red and blistered with severe pain. Third degree, you have something that requires immediate emergency attention, um, and tissues might be burned too in that case. So please know the difference between the three different types of burns. That's something you might see on the PACT exam. So first aid, first aid can be used to care for things. Um, you want to make sure that you run water in it and cover with it. It helps it cool. It's going to hurt as soon as it's done cooling, but that's just the case. Um, if, you can, if you can elevate the body part to relieve discomfort, that helps. It'll change the blood flow. But this last idea here is very important. If it involves the feet, hands, or genitals, you need to make sure that that requires immediate medical attention, um, and that's something, that, that's something that you need to be aware of. So eye injuries come from playing. Um, kids are running around on the playground, they're trying to play tag. You know that a kid is going to accidentally poke their hand out and somebody's going to be poked in the eye, or throwing a snowball or a wooden block. Um, the child will probably scream first for a while, be ready for that. They're going to think they're in more pain than they are. What you can do, though, is to try to keep them quiet, give them an ice pack, let them relax it, give them a chance to revitalize it, and use direct pressure if you need to and then inform the parents of what happened and what caused it. So fractures are breaks in bones. Um, teachers should check, you know, basically, if there's a break in skin, if skin color has changed, if they have pain after falling, that's something they should consider as well. Um, one of the best things that you can do um, is wait until help arrives if you're not trained in, in something specifically to deal with fractures. So heat exhaustion is something that I will argue that you will all see, especially if you're working in an early learning center, because a lot of the times parents will send their children to early learning centers during the summer. It's more common. Um, so kids are going to get heat exhaustion, and it's why you, know, you need to be prepared for this. My advice for you is to always have a cooler of water on hand. Make sure that they are drinking frequently. Even have a checklist and chart when they take a sip of water. And that's probably one of the smartest ways to stop heat exhaustion. So a heat stroke is scary. It's when they have a very high body temperature. Um, you need to cool and get medical assistance almost immediately. So nosebleeds. Um, nosebleeds can be problems. It can be an accidental bump. It can be a kid picks his nose too hard. Um, they could shove a tissue in, the, in, in their nose or they could shove a pencil up their nose. Nosebleeds can be caused by a lot of different things. Um, the best thing that you can do is have the child cover their nose with a tissue, lean forward, and not swallow blood. That will help you, and then once the bleeding stops, you have to monitor it. If it, if it doesn't stop, then try again, and then you need to be notifying somebody because it could be something more serious. <clears throat> Some of you will have children that have seizures. If that happens, you have to seek help. Everybody should stay calm. Um, if it's the first time that a child is having a seizure in their life, that's going to be very difficult for them. Um, you have to seek help. Um, you want to do as much as you can to get them to the floor, elevate their head, loosen tight clothing from the neck, and make sure they're careful, and then move them to a quiet area so that they're able to rest. So 
Tooth emergencies, we've already spoke about this earlier. Kids could have a loose tooth, an emerging tooth, or a chip in the tooth. If it's not by a blower,